Good morning. Will you please stand with us? seconds and greet one another before you are seated. take your seats we are going to go into this short connect video and we will be right back welcome to one church our church is all about people becoming disciples of Jesus what does that look like we connect 
we grow, and we make a difference. A special welcome to all guests. Whether it's your first time, second time, or maybe you haven't been here in a while, we are so glad you're here. In the seat back pocket in front of you, you'll find a card labeled, so you're new here. This will provide a few details to make your visit the best it can be. Also in the seat back pocket, you'll find the connect card. If you're here for the first time, fill that out and let us know you're here. Bring it to the hub in the back and we got some special info and a gift for you there. If you're here for the second time, we would love to know you're back. Fill out your connect card, bring it to the hub. We've got a special gift for you as well. A $10 gift card of your choice. Whether you're a guest or a regular, the connect card is a way to sign up for things. Information about the church, ministry or events, as well as opportunities to volunteer and serve. You can also request prayer or let us know of a decision that you're making today to follow Jesus. After filling out the connect card, you can place it in the offering or drop it by the hub on your way out. We are so glad you're here. Good morning, good morning church. My name's Grady. I'm the youth director here. How's everyone doing? Happy late Thanksgiving. Um, hey, so I just wanted to come up here. We have a few things that we want to bring to your guys' attention today. Uh, the first one is if you're new here, fill out the Connect card like it said in the video, and you get a free One Church Tumblr mug, okay? You can put coffee in here. You can put tea in here, water. Whatever you like to drink, you can put it in this cup. You know, I don't own one, but I've heard that they work great, okay? <laughs> hey, if it's, your, if it's your second time here, we have another gift for you as well. Who doesn't like two gifts? If you don't like two gifts and you're lying to me because I love free things, okay? Um, so, again, just fill out this Connect card and then take it back to the hub if this is your second time as well. On December 10th, we actually have our Connect Lunch. So if this is your first time being here or second time being here, we would love for you to sign up. This is one of the ways that you guys get plugged into our church and starting a membership here. It's a time where you get to meet the people that are here on staff. You get to actually go to their house and you get to have a nice lunch with them. You get to know who they are as, as staff and as people. And they also get to know who you are. Um, the next thing that we have coming up is our One Church Christmas at the Gallo on December 22nd. This is a great event. We're so excited for it. It's where everyone in our church from all of our networks get to get together um, and celebrate, celebrate Christmas. Uh, if you guys know people who don't go to church, this is a great time to invite them. To invite them, bring their, bring their whole family because we're going to have something for the adults and the kids. So it's going to be great. We would love for you guys to be there and also love for you to bring your family. On December 10th, we're having a youth Christmas party, which I'm excited about since I'm the youth director. <laughs> but, uh, hey, so we're going to do a $5 gift exchange. We're going to have free food. We're going to have games. It's going to be a great time. It's going to be from 6 to 7.30. So if you know any youth, invite them. If you have family that have students, invite them. If you are a parent, encourage your students to invite their friends. We have things in the back right by the hub if you want to pick up more information about it. Or you can come up and ask me about it as well. Um, right now, I want to kick it off to this video of... Pastor Shelley and Pastor Tracy. Good morning, One Church River Bay. It's Tracy and Shelley from Houston, Texas, where we've celebrated Thanksgiving with Jessa and Eli, and they are doing great. Thank you for your prayers and support. This morning, we got a couple wins we want to share with you. I was so excited to hear about Miracle Sunday last week, Sunday. I am so sad that I couldn't be there, but the offering total for the day on Miracle Sunday was $9,634. That is a huge blessing, and I am so thankful to be part of a giving church. And if you didn't have a chance to participate and you'd still like to give to Miracle Sunday, uh, you can just note that on your offering um, as Miracle Sunday on your envelope, okay? All right, the other thing we had last week was our Kingdom Builders Dinner and Celebration. We had about 40 people there, and we shared the vision for 2018 in Kingdom Builders. Along with that, we had 24 partners commit to being Kingdom Builders next year with over $2,600 in pledges. Well, we're excited about that, but we want to do more for the Kingdom of God, above and beyond what we've did in the past. So. If you've not partnered with us, you can find the information back by the Kingdom Builders wall where you can get our goals for 2018 and you can make a pledge to commit with us and be partners as Kingdom Builders and we see what God can do in 2018. 
if you need to pray on it, please spend some time doing that. We are looking forward to what God has in store for us to be a part of in 2018, and we'd love to partner with you doing good things for the kingdom. Once again, we thank you for your generosity and your blessings. And in just a minute, we're gonna be receiving our tithe and kingdom builders offering this morning. And I just again say, thank you for giving through one church to see the kingdom of God built. So God bless, we'll see you next week. Love you. Hey man, let's just give it up for that offering from last week, guys, that's so awesome. Um, right now, we can have the ushers come forward. Um, one of the things that we say here a lot is that we don't give to one church, we give through one church. This is an opportunity for all of us to, to be obedient to God's word and to be generous with, with our tithes and offering today as, as kingdom builders. So let's pray. God, thank you for this day, God. Um, just, as, just as your word says, God, as, as we're obedient to the tithes, you bless us abundantly, God. And so today, God, I, I pray and I, and I ask. For, for the people who are obedient with their tithes, that you bless them abundantly, not just in their finances, God, but in their lives. In your name we pray. Amen.
us your glory. Show us your glory. In wonder and surrender we fall down. Show us your glory. Show us your glory. Let every burning heart be holy ground. So 
this place today, Lord, and continue to worship you and lift your name this morning. Lord, as we draw closer to you, you will draw closer to us, Lord. I pray that uh, continue to, to work in hearts this morning, Lord, and continue to do your work, Lord. I pray that uh, a special touch over everyone here today, Lord. The atmosphere is changing now. For the Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around. The Spirit of the Lord is here. The atmosphere is changing now. Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around. The Spirit of the Lord is here. Flow in this place to fill our hearts with your love, your love. Fresh on us, we need. 
atmosphere's changing now. The Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around. The Spirit of the Lord is here. Sing that one more time. The atmosphere is changing. spirit that brings peace well there's something about when you show up it shifts the atmosphere that it changes the the whole room it changes our attitudes it changes our hearts so lord even right now lord we just invite you to bring peace to bring reassurance Lord, to those even right now lord before we even get into the message lord there's some that today it's it's just holding on, just holding on, and, and, and they're gripping, gripping life, just trying to make it through. But I pray even right now, your spirit of peace would come on them, give them strength, God. We thank you, we praise you, in Jesus' name. Come on, if he's been good to you, can you give him some praise this morning? Come on, he's awesome. All right. You guys can go ahead and sit down. Man, it's good to be in church. Isn't it good to be in church? Come on. Hey, my name's Caleb. Uh, I know many of you and some of you I haven't met yet. Um, I'm the youth pastor over at the Bethel campus for our, our network and kind of like the champion of youth ministry of sorts, for lack of a better term. Uh, and so I get to work with uh, Grady, your all's youth director, all the time and uh, our, our ripping youth directors and a whole bunch of stuff. It's, it's just incredible. How many of y'all appreciate Grady? Come on. Man, he has just done a phenomenal job. Uh, I know that youth ministry for some looks like babysitting. It's not, I promise. Uh, but, but Grady really uh, has the right heart and is just an incredible man of God. I'm so glad that he's here and he's pushing to reach the youth in this city, in this town. It's such an incredible thing. Uh, if you've got teenagers, I want to encourage you. Send them on Sunday nights and then get by yourself. Go have fun. Be a, an adult or something, <laughs> you know? I'm just saying, you might as well enjoy it. Uh, <laughs> But bring them, bring them over, and man, we, we've just, we've got incredible youth ministry. I think one of the cool things that we've noticed with youth ministry, with our network even, is that um, actually, like, we have students that float from youth group to youth group, and so we have some Riverbank students that regularly come to Catalyst on Wednesday nights uh, in, in Modesto, and then we have Modesto students that go to Ripon, and we have Modesto students that come to Riverbank, so it's just really cool how it all mixes, because we really are one church. Isn't that a cool thing? And so, uh, man, I, I just love that. Hey, quick shout out to, to Pastor Tracy. I think that's the camera, so I'm looking at you, Pastor Tracy. Uh, <laughs> hey, so glad to be able he, to be here and to share. Uh, man, I, I appreciate it. Tracy is, uh, man, one of the first people that I met from One Church was Pastor Tracy. And just really, uh, you guys know, he's incredible. He's a great, great man of God. Yeah, go ahead, give it up for, for our pastor. So I get to share with you guys today and... Uh, I'm going I'm to share a word with you that I think is fitting for our holiday season. Uh, you already see it up there. And, and yet, uh, this, this, this phrase, don't worry, uh, it's funny because it actually, by saying don't worry, how many of y'all like immediately begin to worry? <laughs> <laughs> so as I, I'm going to preach to you today a, a message called don't worry, and all of the anxiety in the room intensifies because whenever someone tells us not to worry, uh, the, the first thought is what should I be worrying about, <laughs> Right? It's just the immediate thought. We move into all the things that could go wrong, all the problems that we could face. But I want to encourage you today, don't worry, okay? Don't worry. Here's, here's uh, reality. We're going into holiday season right now. And uh, some of you already felt it. I don't know if anyone went to Black Friday shopping this week, okay? I went, okay, with my three-year-old daughter and five-month-old son and my wife. Made it happen, okay? I'm real proud 
But I think that like the Black Friday experience sums up the holidays in a lot of in a lot of ways, right? It's this hustle, this constant movement. We're like we're waiting in lines, we're pushing through crowds, we're trying to be polite, but not so polite we get ran over, right? It's, <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's just it is the holiday season. This is real life, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna switch over because for whatever reason my tablet is tripping out on me. But, uh, but we got our budgets to balance, right? We come into the holiday season, and there's, there's all this budgeting. And so immediately, we start thinking about Christmas. I don't know about you, but like for me, I'm like, okay, somehow we got to do this. I was watching the news the other night, and it said that the average family spends over $1,000 on Christmas, uh, which, you know, I, you guys are probably like, yeah, no big deal. To me, I'm like, that's a lot of money. I don't know. But like to me, that's a lot of money to spend on Christmas. We definitely don't spend that on Christmas. But like when I think about like Christmas, that's one of the things, man, there can be worry about money. There's worry about the schedule because it's just moving all the time. We got, we got parties. We got kids things going on. We got youth things going on. We got adult things going on. If you're involved in a charity, they want to honor you. It's Christmas. Like there's just all kinds of different things that are going on, and it is nonstop. There's so much to worry about in the season. So I want to encourage you, don't worry. Don't worry. You know, uh, I think there's, if there's one thing that, that had in, influenced me to worry more in my life, unfortunately, uh, also brought a lot of joy, and uh, I love it, is, is having kids, right? Any, any parent in this room can attest that, like, like kids, like, exponential growth in worry, like, on the night they are born. <laughs> it's just is what it is. I remember, I remember taking my firstborn daughter I only have one daughter, so my daughter, but our firstborn child, and we, we put her in the car seat, and we put her in the car, and like, you know, first time doing it, I'm a little worried that I even done it right in the first place. Like, I read the manual, but I don't know. So I put her in the car, and we're driving her home, and in my mind, as I'm, I'm gripping the steering wheel, trying, you know, like, I'm never nervous about driving, but in this moment, I'm like nervous that I'm going to crash because I've got my little girl sitting there, and I'm thinking to myself, I can't believe that they're letting me take this little girl home. <laughs> <laughs> Because, I mean, I, I remember laying up at night and, like, listening to try to figure out if she's breathing, getting up in the middle of the night and, like, touching her nose, <laughs> just trying to figure, like, okay, is she alive? I, I could barely sleep the first few nights because, man, I've got this life that I'm responsible for, right? And I'm sure that it doesn't get easier. I, I, I've, I'm a youth pastor, and so, like, I've, I've talked to parents of teenagers. I know it doesn't get easier. <laughs> it just changes, and it evolves, but it's so easy to worry about the day-to-day. And then that's not even talking about college funds and how are we going to pay for it. I mean, there is so much to worry about. There really is. But, but here's what worry does, right? Worry seeks to control those things that we cannot control. Why are we worried? It's because we're trying to do things that we literally were not built to do. We try to control these things. And, and there's different ways that we can do it. Some of us, uh, we try to control those things by just f- avoiding them <laughs> and hoping maybe they'll go away. And so we're not emotionally invested. And then, Lord, please help us. Hopefully this will work, right? There's, there's that way that we deal with worry. And then there's the other way that we literally try to control every detail and every aspect, right? And we've got all the personalities, most likely if you're married in the room then you are one and the other person is the other, right? And we deal with worry in our different ways, but it's real. And I would say this, that, that the healthy is probably somewhere in the middle of those two because we've got to do what we can do, right? But we also have to come to a place where we can release our control and have faith in God, yeah. right? Yeah. And God is real honest. I, I, I love the Bible. Um, I, I, I tell our youth this all the time. Like, like this book is really incredible, it's not just like a book that we read or whatever. This, this book really does empower us and changes our lives. And it's so cool because it's honest. <laughs> you know, like I feel like everybody's got an angle. If I'm watching TV, everybody's got an angle. Everybody's trying to do something. But this book is honest and it's real. And God speaks through this thing and brings truth. And, and God's honest about, uh, about worry. It says this in 1 Peter chapter 5, it says this. So humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. And at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and all your cares to God, for he cares for you. So I said, look, humble yourselves. Understand that we cannot control everything. Humble ourselves under the the hand of God. God, I I need you. That's what that is. It's, It's coming to God and saying, God, you're greater, you're stronger. I need your help. I can't do this on my own. Humble ourselves 
under God's hand, and God's going to lift us up in the right time. And then he goes on to say, look, if you've got worry, if you've got cares, which I think everyone in this room does, lay them before God. Just give them up. So God wants to take our worries. Now, now here's, here's the thing. When I, when I hear some things like this, if it wasn't the Bible, I'd be like, okay. Because I'm a little bit cynical at times, okay? I hear people talk, and I'm like, yeah, reality check. Let's really talk about this. But, but like, this sounds almost, almost like it's from trolls or something. You know, like, it's just, like, just all happy and hugs. <laughs> like, just cast your cares to the Lord. Just, just give them up. But, but like... Like, like, it's easy to maybe, but, but God understands. And, and in fact, this book, it, it, Peter was actually writing to a persecuted church. So while it sounds just bright and happy, the, he's writing this to Christians that as they walk out their door in the morning, they might get killed for their faith. So he's not saying, hey, pretend like it's all all right. He's saying, look, we live in a crazy world. And there's a lot of things that can go wrong. And there's a lot of things we can't control. So you know what? Let's, let's understand that God has more control than we do. Let's humble ourselves. Let's come to him with what we need. And then let's take and release our worries to him because it doesn't help us to worry anyways. And he's talking to a persecuted church, to real life situations. And he would say the same thing to you and to me. And although we might not have to worry about dying as we walk out of our, out of our door for our faith, at the same time, we face real worries every single day. Some of our worries might deal with, with our bills, deals with our family. Some of y'all are already worried about Christmas because Thanksgiving with the family was crazy. <laughs> Right? There's so many things, and, and, and we've got to take and come to God and recognize life is hard. Life can be difficult, but you know what? I don't have to worry. And that's why Peter even says this. He goes on in this verse, and he says, uh, says this. He says, stay alert. Stay alert. Look around. Be conscientious here, because the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for the ones that he can devour. Real problems. Real people, real issues, real hope. Look, we face real spiritual battle. And there's a real devil that has real negative plans for your life that really wants to take you out. And there could be cause for worry. And yet we have a God who's greater than anything that comes against us. Because if my God is for me, who can be against me? I don't have to fear the terrors of night. I don't have to fear the, what, what's going to happen in the day. I don't have to worry about the bills and all these things. Now, here's the other side, too, is that we can't blame, like, everything on the devil, right? It's not when a bush shakes the devil. Like, that's not what it is. <laughs> we, we've got to understand that, like, hey, there's some things that's just a part of life. And you know what? Paying bills is a part of life. Family issues, it's a part of life. These are a part of life. But you know what? Let's not stand and try to control it all. Let's release our worry to God. Let's release him to God. See, here's, here's the, the deal is that worry robs us of our peace and our joy today. See, worry says, survive today, peace and joy will come tomorrow. But the problem is that there's always something new to worry about. There's always something new. Always something new. So we've got to release our worry today so we can have peace and joy today. And I talked to you guys about this. Say, hey, you know, this is real people, real issues in the Bible. I, I, I want to share with you a story uh, that, that I think is pretty incredible. It's about a prophet named Elijah. Some of you guys may have heard of him. Or you, you may have, uh, if you've been in church for a while, you might have heard some of the stories here. But um, I, I'm going to set this up. So Elijah's a prophet of God, and he's in a nation where everybody in this nation uh, is basically turning against God, and they're serving Baal. So, uh, so this is the Israelite nation. They're, they're supposed to be worshiping God, but in fact, they're worshiping Baal. They're, they're in a pagan religion. And Elijah is done with this. God speaks to him. He's taken a stand. He calls a drought, prays for there to be a drought. There would be no rain, and there's no rain for years, years. And then eventually he comes to a point, and he had seen plenty of miracles, comes to a point, and God speaks to him to go ahead and to call out the king and to challenge the king and the priests of this pagan, pagan religion. And so what he did, he, he called out the king, which I think is a pretty bold, pretty audacious move. 
And he says, hey, why don't you meet me over at Mount Carmel here, and we're going to have a showdown, and we're going to see whose God is real. And so they come up to Mount Carmel, they build an altar, and they say, hey, we're going we're to make this, this sacrifice, we're going to set it all up, and then we're going to call down fire from heaven. Whoever can call down fire to this exact altar and, like, blow up this altar, that person has the real God, and then, like, like everyone else, if, if, you're, if you're the priest of the other religion, you're just going to be destroyed. It's, it's, it's done for you. And so this is kind of the setup here. So they come up to Mount Carmel, and, and these, these other priests, for hours and hours and hours of the pagan religion, are are. are cutting themselves, and they're screaming, and they're begging for their God to take and to send this fire down from heaven, and, and nothing ever comes. And then Elijah takes, and he says a simple prayer. I think it's all of a paragraph, probably said it in about 45 seconds, and fire comes down. I, I just, like, how incredible, number one, for fire to come down from heaven. Like, that's phenomenal. But if you think about it, too, like, well, it could have just somehow been like a flame that came from a mountain. How would that even happen? And then to land at the exact spot, this tiny area of an altar, with such intensity and ferocity that it burns up everything on the altar and laps up the water that had been poured on it. I mean, this is like just unreal, God, you're so cool kind of miracle. So, so he takes and he, he, he wins this and the prophets of Baal are destroyed. And then, and then now he says, okay, we're going to go. We're going to pray for rain now because, you know what, we see that God is real. Everybody sees it. I've proved it. We're going to pray for rain now. So then he goes ahead. He starts praying for rain. He, he gets down on his knees. And then literally as he prays for rain, clouds appear and it rains. It's been a drought for years. And it just starts raining as he's praying. How incredible is this? Then he takes and he chases down and he, he passes up a chariot with horses. I don't know if you've ever raced a horse before. Probably not. Maybe. I don't know. Uh, I haven't, but I would imagine it would be difficult to beat him, okay? And this horse is pulling a chariot. He, he beats the king's chariot to the place that he's going. I mean, miracle after miracle after miracle. How incredible God is. How great God is. And then after all of these incredible miracles, the queen hears about what had happened to her prophets of Baal, and she's upset. She says, hey, uh, Elijah, I want to make sure you get this message. I'm coming after you. I'm going to kill you. Like, intense now. So we went straight from like, victory, to you're going to die. So this is like <laughs> big contrast, big contrast. And, and now this is a man of God, so we would imagine, right, man of God, he's a prophet of the Lord. He called down fire from heaven. He's going to take that, that thing from Jezebel and say, Jezebel, you better watch out because God's about, to, like, I, I would imagine, like, my natural response, if I didn't know the story already, is like, hey, you better watch out because Elijah's the man and God's got his back. But here's Elijah, and now he's just called down fire from heaven. He's, he's, he's called in rain. He's gone ahead. He's outran chariots, all miraculous things, and then now... A woman who is the queen says, I'm going to take, I'm going to do this. And he, all of a sudden, he is scared. He's scared. The Bible says this in 1 Kings. It says, Elijah was afraid. He was afraid. Isn't it amazing that we can see God do incredible things? We can see him provide time after time after time. We could see the miracle, and we could see people get healed, and we could see uh, uh, the results of kingdom builders and what God's doing through that. And we could see, like, like, lives being changed on a Sunday morning here at church and the community as it's growing. And we're, wow, this is incredible. Look what God has done. And then <laughs> something new comes into the picture, and all of a sudden we're afraid. We've forgotten about how great our God is. We've forgotten about his faithfulness. And now all we can see is that there's a threat on my life. And the Bible says that, that he ran for his life. He wasn't just afraid. He then ran for his life. I mean, this is an intense response. And then when he comes to Beersheba and Judah, he left his servant there at Beersheba. And then he himself went away on a day's journey into the wilderness. Just takes off. And isn't it interesting that, like, in a time of crisis, in a time that, like, you would imagine he would want support, he actually left his support system behind him and tried to go off by himself. Isn't that what worry does to us? I can think of so many times that I've got something on my mind, and my wife is trying to talk to me, and she's being real nice, but I'm not. 
And I've got to, like, get right, okay? Real talk, right? And Because I've got all this stuff on my mind. I'm trying to work everything out. And she's like, man, why are you so, like, just, nah, today? Why are you, why are you like this? <laughs> and I'm like, I, I, I just, you know, I'm just, uh, just thinking. Because, you know, I, I've got to figure it out. I've got, to, I've got to have the answer. And isn't it so weird that, like, in the time that we need counsel, we need advice, we need prayer, Instead of getting all of that, we take and we isolate ourselves and push ourselves from the very people who are meant to help us. Man, that's why it's so important to be here at church. You guys are awesome for being here. This is such a big deal because we connect with one another. It's the community of the faith. It's the community of the believers that gives us encouragement in times when it's difficult. So the Bible says he got by himself and he came to a broom bush. He sat under it. He prayed that he might die. A little dramatic, kind of sounds like a, like a teenager, a little bit. <laughs> it said, I've had enough, Lord. It said, take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. And then he laid down under the bush and fell asleep. Like, this is such a teenage moment. Like, and this is supposed to be the man of God, the prophet, and he's fallen asleep under a tree saying, let me die, okay? <laughs> But well, once again, I think it just highlights, I mean, how interesting that he had seen all these miracles. But yet, I wonder if he had a different expectation of what the outcome of the miracles would be. I wonder, I wonder if maybe he thought that when he called down fire from heaven and the prophets of Baal were destroyed, that, that in fact it would be revival in his nation. I wonder if he thought that from then on everyone would serve God and he wouldn't be under threat of death anymore and he would finally have the light at the end of the tunnel. I don't know if you've been there before. And we've been praying and praying and praying and believing for something to happen, believing it's going to happen. And, and you know, and then we do what we can do, and we're trying not to worry. We're trying to release things in faith, and we're moving towards it. And we finally get to that place that it looks like this is what God intended. This is what I've worked for. This is what I've prayed for. This is what I've believed for. And God does a miracle. But then when we get there, it's less than what we had hoped. And it's not that God has failed us or that God has let us down, but it's that God's plan is greater than ours. Right. And oftentimes in those moments, it, it, can, it can begin to, to harbor some, some worry into our lives. God, am I just going to live this way forever? And I would imagine that this is how Elijah felt in that moment. God, am I just going to have to do this forever? I thought this was going to end. You know what? I would rather just be out of here. And all at once, as he slept, the angel, an angel came and touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some baked bread and a jar of water. How many of y'all would love to wake up with fresh baked bread next to your head? <laughs> and an angel just, hey, bud, get up and eat. You know, like, that's incredible. Here, another amazing miracle. Wouldn't that speak of the provision of God? And it says that he ate and he drank. And he lay down again. And then the angel of the Lord came back a second time. He wakes up. Get up and eat. But the journey's too much for you. I, I don't think it was the journey that was coming, but I think it was the journey that he was on. He was too tired. It, it, it had become too heavy for him. I, I think that we've been there again. And worry can build up in these moments. And, and the journey's too much for you. So he got up. He ate and he drank. And then he did what all of us do after we eat and drink. Strengthened by the food, he traveled for 40 days and 40 nights. That's weird. Uh, <laughs> he traveled for 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. And then he went into the cave and spent the night. It's irrational. <laughs> and this, this, once again, once again, this, this is what worry can do to us. We start to do things that don't even make sense because of fear. Man, worry can be such a destructive force in our lives. And what's amazing to me is that in the midst of the worry, in the midst of like the craziness for Elijah, that God still gave him the food he needed to sustain him. That even when he was taking a crazy journey that didn't make sense, God still sustained him with strength. Look, even when we're lost, even when we're having a hard time, God will still sustain us. And the word of the Lord came to him as he's hanging out in the cave. 
And God speaks and says, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? I think this is just an interesting part of the story because all of it's so dramatic, you know, leading up to this. And you got him, he runs for 40 days and, and it goes over to a mountain, hides in a cave. It's like this intense everything. And then God just stops in the middle of it all. What are you doing here? I can think back to a lot of times in my life that I was in the middle of the cave in the wilderness of my life, that I had gone and I'm dealing with everything I'm dealing with. I'm dealing with worry. I'm dealing with fear. I've got, I've got all kinds of things going on, and I'm, I'm trying to figure it out. I've isolated myself, and God says, what are you doing here? What are you doing? It's almost like God was like, hey, do you think that you couldn't have met me where you were at? Sometimes we go to, to, to everyone else for our answers. And we go, man, I, I gotta go to church for the answer. Look, the church is a great community and this is a place for you to learn and for you to grow. We need to be committed to the church. I already talked about that. It's a place to encounter God. And God will encourage you and me as we come to church. Man, it's a big deal. And yet, this is not like when we go through things, okay, I just need a miracle. I need a prophecy. I need something crazy to happen to me so that way I can finally receive. In fact, I would, I would wonder if that's what Elijah might have been looking for. Did you know that Mount Horeb was the same mountain that God appeared to Moses on? And it didn't appear again in Scripture until Elijah came back to this place. This was the same mountain that, that, that Moses saw God face to face, and, Mo, and, and God passed by Moses and gave him the Ten Commandments. And, and, and you know what's interesting is that God, God even goes on. I'm, just, I'm skipping a little bit to, uh, to verse 11. God goes on and, and, and he says, go out and stand in the mountain in the presence of the Lord. After Elijah had made his excuse of why he was there. He says, go, go out and, and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord and God's about to pass by. And then it says that a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart. Okay, once again, how incredible. I mean, this is an incredible life of, of following God right now. Miracle after miracle after miracle. So here, here again. Now a powerful wind tears the mountains apart, but God wasn't in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face. He went out and he stood at the mouth of the cave. And God once again said, what are you doing here? As if he didn't get it the first time. You see, I, I think Elijah was looking for God to do something big and miraculous to change everything. To take his worry away. Because I understand that these same signs of the wind and the earthquake and the fire, these were the same things that accompanied Moses on the mountain. When Moses encountered God, it was with all of this fanfare, all of this incredible things happening. But God was saying, look, in this season, yeah, that's maybe what it was in that season. That might have been what I did before and might have been what I did for them. But in this season, it's not about all the noise. It's not about all the show. But it's about the still, small voice. I once heard someone say that we can't underestimate the importance of big events. But we also can't under underestimate the voice of the small voice and the small events in our lives, and that those might be turning points of what God is doing for us. Man, it's so easy to say, man, I, I'm going through this. I just need a prophetic word. I, I, I remember uh, there was a season of my life I was going through things. And I, I would come to church, and every Sunday I'd, like, get prayed for, and I'm like, God, please give me a prophetic word. Because I, I just needed something, and I, I wanted fireworks. And you know what God kept on doing is I would show up, and God said, I love you, I care for you, you're gonna be all right. And, and it wasn't like through anyone else, it was just in my heart. I mean, don't underestimate the power of the small voice that shows God's care for you, that shows that we can trust him wherever we are and whatever we're going through. Man, this is such an important part of the story. And then Elijah then has the responsibility to change his attitude just like we do. To not keep looking for God in all the big things, but to find God in the small. You see, Elijah might have been looking for God in what he could see, but God was at work in the unseen. Worry? Hi, Siri. 
<laughs> Sorry, I heard like a Siri noise. <laughs> Got me. Okay. <laughs> Worry limits us into believing only what we can see. That's what it does. But Paul encourages us in the Bible that we live by faith, not by sight. We live by faith, not by sight. I, I don't need the flash and bang from God. I don't need to see God's path on everything that I'm, that I'm going through. In fact, God might just show me the next step. But you know what? I can trust in that next step. I may not understand how the budget's going to work out, but I know that if I'm diligent and I work hard, we're somehow going to figure this out, and I can trust God he's going to do it, right? I may not know how the family situation is going to work, but I know that if I trust God and just keep on taking the right steps, he's going to work it out. I may not know what's going to happen with my teenager or with my child, but you know what? I know that if I just take the next step and I keep on following him and I listen to that small, still, small voice, I may not see it, but I don't walk by sight. I live by faith. I live in what is unseen. This is what we do. See, here, here's the deal is that worry only has room for a person to control on their own. It, it really limits us to whatever our hands can touch. But faith makes room for those things that have not yet come. Worry keeps us in what we know and faith takes us to the unknown. Worry lives to survive today, but faith lives to see a God-directed tomorrow. And whether it makes sense right now or not, you see, here, here's, again, we, we see with Elijah and the disappointment that he faced and a cause for greater worry in his life. Understand that so many times God's going to do things or allow things that don't make sense to us. And that can shake our faith. That can shake us and make us feel like, man, God, can I even trust you? But once again, we humble ourselves before God. We give him our care. And he takes care of us. We live in a real world with real worry. So we've got to learn how to have faith in this real world that we're in. We've got to learn how to walk with faith and not by sight, not by worry. Andrew, can you come up, or whoever's playing the keys? I think it's Andrew. There you go. I, I, want, I want to give a, a four, four thoughts on how to live by faith in the real world. All right, if you're taking notes, you can write some of these down. First is this. Remember what God has done, done for us before. And we've got to remember. I, I, I wonder what would have happened if Elijah, instead of getting caught up in the moment of just what was going on, I wonder what would happen if he took just a minute to remember that God literally sent fire down from heaven and that God literally sent rain, that, that earlier on in his life he was fed by ravens. Like, who's, who's fed by birds? But I, I wonder what would have happened. I wonder what his response would have been. I wonder if there would have been an increase in his faith if he would have remembered the faithfulness of God. And you know what? Whenever I've come into difficult times in my life, it's the hardest thing to do. But man, it changes my perspective when I come to a place and say, you know what, God? I don't understand this right now, but I do know that last time you came through. God, I, I don't understand why it seems like every time that we get ahead, something else pulls us back behind. But I do understand that last time I thought I was going behind, somehow you launched us forward. God, I, I don't understand, like, how it's all going to work out. But, God, I've seen you be faithful before. I've seen it work out with the bills before. I've seen it work out with family. I've seen it work out with my friends. I've seen your miracles. I've seen you touch people's lives. I've seen them transform. And so, God, I may not see it now. I may not understand it now. But, God, I can have faith because of what you've done. It increases our faith. And that's why Colossians says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Be thankful. Second is this. We need to remind ourselves of God's promises. See, when we remember what he's done, we, we, we remember what he's done, right? The past, and that encourages us. 
But this is about remembering what he will do. Because remembering his promises is not so much about reminding him what he's promised. It's about reminding us. Because I forget. And that's why the scripture says to trust in the Lord with all of our heart. To trust in his word. Trust in his promises. Continue to lean into who he is. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him. And he will make your path straight. Third. Release our worries in prayer. Man, I know this is cliche, guys. I understand it. You've been in church for a minute, and everybody says to pray. Hey, that's cool. But here's the deal. It really works. It really does. See, we can remember what he's done, and we can remember what he will do, but now we've got to take and submit ourselves to what he will do. That's what prayer does. And you know what? Prayer is like a counselor, <laughs> right? I, I, uh, in the last couple of years, I've, I've started this practice where when I'm going through something, I, I'll, I'll take it, I'll kind of like pause everything, and I'll just go into a room and just talk to God. And I talk like this, like, and I'm just like, okay, God, look, here's the deal. <laughs> and I explain everything that's going on and how I feel about it and what I think should be happening and what is happening and how it needs to be fixed. And I'll do it all. And I'll express, because God can handle it, right? And then I say, say you know, but God, here's the deal. I, I'm going to release this to you. God, I'm going to trust you. And I begin to declare his promises. And I remind myself of how he's been faithful. But first, I'm just honest with how I feel. There's something about that. I feel like sometimes as Christians, we, we have like this pressure to always be perfectly happy. And it's not real. Real people, real issues, real hope. In order to get the real hope, we have to have real issues. <laughs> have to have something that we hope we get out of, right? Like... There's got to be this. We, we've got to be people that, hey, let's be honest about where we are. Let's be real. And, and so the Bible says, don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, once again, God, you've been good. Present your request to God. <clears throat> and then the God of peace, which will, or then the God of peace, which transcends all understanding, will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. If we want peace in our hearts and in our minds... We've got to start bringing our stuff to the Lord. Lastly is this. Do what we can as we pray for God to do what we can't. So all the other ones, those are all like faith abstract, right? Just declare it. Just declare it. Okay, here's, here's the book of Proverbs, <laughs> right? The rest of the Bible is very spiritual in a lot of ways. Proverbs is practical. This is what you do. So he, here's what we do. We research, we talk to people, we get advice. And, and look, I understand it's embarrassing to ask for advice from people sometimes. I get it, I get it. But we've gotta humble ourselves, we gotta go figure out information, we gotta to talk to people who know more than us, we gotta go onto Google, bless the Lord for Google, and we've gotta find some things and try to figure out what to do. We've gotta go into our budgets and break everything down and look at it all. We've gotta take and look at the possibilities, talk to a lawyer, we gotta look at all the, the different things. And then once we've done everything that we can do, you know what we do at that point? Release it to the Lord. Do you understand that faith isn't inactivity, Believing just that God's going to do it all for us. Faith is activity, knowing God's going to meet us in the middle of it. That's what it is. Ecclesiastes says, whatever, you find, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Whatever you can do, do it. There's nothing simple about being active. But faith is going to require us to give up control at some point. That's how we release the worry. You know, recently, um, recently we've been looking at like all of our all of our stuff. My wife and I, and we're trying to figure out. Okay, we're I think we're gonna we're we're gonna move. We're, you know, like in the city, we're, we're gonna like probably like downsize, and then we're, we're looking at maybe buying a house. And we're trying to figure out all the possibilities and. It's stressful, right? Like, though you have done this before, it's, it's stressful trying to work it all out and all these intangibles, all these kind of things. And when I was prepping for this message, and I, I just felt in my heart, 
the Lord said to talk about worry. And I was like, God, I think you just mean like that I need to study worry for myself. (laughs) Because like, it's a real thing. But we don't have to live here. And right now, I am in the process with maybe many of you of practicing this out. Saying, God, in this area of my life that I don't fully understand how it's all going to work out, there's a ton of variables and and the stakes are high. God, I'm just going to take and trust you. That's where we live. That's how we live three or four. So could we do this all across the room? Can we close our eyes just for a minute? There's some of you today that um, that maybe you 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 haven't met the God that can free you from worry yet. Maybe you haven't given your life to Jesus. Jesus says that his yoke is easy and his burden is light, and that, that, that means that we can have peace as we follow him. But we have to give some things up too. We have to turn away from our sin. We gotta, gotta surrender our worries, our cares. We gotta surrender uh, our control in our life. So today, if you haven't met him and you wanna meet him, I wanna give you an opportunity with all eyes closed. Can you just lift up your hand right now if that's you? Awesome. Now, there's, there's many of you today that, that maybe you can relate to worry. Maybe this was a timely message. This is exactly what you needed to hear. And I just want to pray for you. I want to agree in prayer that today will be a day of stepping into peace in your life. So with all eyes closed, no one looking around, if you'd say, you know what, I've been dealing with worry, and I, I just, I would like some prayer. Could you just lift up your hand real quick? Got hands all over the room. I'm going to pray. God, I thank you for for every person here today, those who are in a season where there's a lot of worry and those who are not worrying at all. God, Lord, I I, I know, God, that even when we're not worrying, worry might be in our future. So this is good for them too. But God, I I pray specifically for those who raise their hands today. Say, man, I'm dealing with worry. God, I pray that today that they would cast their cares on you and God, that there would be a freedom from the burdens of life today. God, not an abdication of responsibility, not just releasing responsibility, but God, instead, walking in faith, Lord, doing what we can do, but also trusting that you're going to do what we can't. So, God, I pray, Lord, for freedom from worry, freedom from fear, freedom from anxiety in the name of Jesus. And, God, I speak peace, God, into the life of every person in this room today. We praise you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Grady's going to come up, and you'll direct them about the prayer team. Awesome. Thanks, man. Thank you, guys. Can you guys just give it up for Pastor Caleb real quick? I was... <laughs> Such a great message. Um, it's an honor to serve alongside you, and um, also just be able to be a part of your team. From being an intern to now being a part of staff. So I want to tell you thank you. Um, we have people here that are on our prayer team, the Scambas and the nuns are back there. Um, if you guys need prayer today about, about the message about worry, go talk to one of them. Be honest with them. Like Pastor Caleb said, you know, in order to find real hope, we need to talk about our issues first. <laughs> um, and so today, I just encourage you guys to do that. Um, you guys are dismissed as well. Uh, thank you for coming to church today. Hope that you guys had a great week, and we hope that you have a better week this week. Um, If you guys want more information about Christmas at the Gallo or our youth event that's coming up on December 10th, go to the back for more information. There are cards there. Um, And youth that are here, we hope to see you this evening at 6 o'clock. So I hope you guys have a great day, and I can't wait to see you guys next week.